I'm Lloyd Llewellyn Jones. I'm Professor of Ancient History with a particular interest in ancient Persia at Cardiff University in Wales. Great. And uh, what is your area of research? The main things I'm interested in is the history and culture of ancient Iran generally from about 1000 BCE until about 1000 uh, CE, so up to the time of Fadosi. Um, but within that, my particular area of expertise on what I've published on the most uh, is on Achaemenid Iran, so 559 through to 331 BCE, the conquest of Darius uh, III by Alexander of Macedon. Um, I'm interested in court culture, high society, which basically is all we have from ancient Persia anyway, uh, of the lived experience of the Persians in antiquity uh, and of international relations in antiquity between the Achaemenid Empire uh, and other states such as Mesopotamia, um, uh, Babylonia in particular, uh, Greece and also India too. That's fascinating and um, what, what, what motivated you to get into ancient Persia as an area of study research. And is that what you started with as well? So my, uh, my career actually started as a classicist. So I was reading, you know, all the Greek texts, Herodotus and Thucydides. Um, and I was finding out the Persians from the, the Greek version. So these kind of rather um, disparaging um, othering comments that the Greek authors were writing and in the imagery that they were creating of the Persians um, in art as well as in literature um, this creates a strange kind of barbarization of, of these Easterners of these oriental despots the buzzword I kept coming up against all the time was was decadence um, and I started thinking okay there has to be another there has to be another narrative here um, sitting behind this prejudice so that's when I started looking, I mean, now we're talking, you know, 25, 30 years ago um, at um, some Persian sources. And at the time, of course, um, Achaemenid studies was still very much in its infancy. Um, it was thanks really to the Achaemenid workshops that were held in Groningen from the 1980s onwards that we began to investigate um, the Persian sources, the Persian background, the Persian version, as it were, um, to set it against the, the Greek and Latin stereotypes that we had been fed in this kind of Eurocentric teachings um, for millennia. And I just found, once I started delving into these incredible sources, Persian cuneiform, Aramaic, Babylonian texts and so forth, this rich wealth of civilization that was happening um, in the Iranian plateau. And I just became besotted by it. I, I mean, I fell in love with, uh, with the subject. And then when I traveled to Iran for the first time 20 years ago, it was actually to make a documentary for Channel 4 on Persepolis. It was my first time there. Um, and I was so moved and so also felt so much at home um, in the place that it became um, a, a real passion of mine. You know, it, 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 my love of ancient Iran goes beyond antiquity. I mean, um, I, I love the way in which modern Iran deals with its pre-Islamic past. I think it's a fascinating area of exploration and I love the way in which the Iranians themselves remember their past as well. I remember um, my colleague Ali Ansari from St Andrews University once said to me, you know Lloyd, it's not that the Iranians don't know their history, it's just that they remember it differently and that's really stuck with me um, throughout my, my research. You know, when you realize therefore that, of course, the Iranian past is filtered not through a Herodotean lens of sort of forensic history, but through memory, song, orality, poetry. And that really enriched the experience of looking at the past in Iran for me. Uh, it's, it's just something that I, I love and it's the, it's the best thing that happened to me was, was finding the, uh, the Iranian version really. Oh, that's incredible and really enthralling and inspiring as well uh, because I um, mean it's nice how Iran comes to us especially when you know we're not Iranian yeah we don't yeah. actually have that um, ingrained heritage as it were but no. sort of no. falling in love with a culture a history a narrative mm. a memory it's, it's, yeah. it's quite something yes uh, but when you're on the ground in Iran and I'm sure you'll have experienced this too there, there is such a there is such a sense of place and culture and sophistication there um, and you can talk to almost anybody in the street and they will participate with you in in that kind of narrative they, they will draw you into 
their Iranian-ness um, as well. And I, I find that very compulsive. Um, I find the Iranian people are, are so open and so genuine and so keen to know about their own past, their own way of remembering they filter to us. But I think it's a great tragedy that very often they're not really being taught um, their history properly or at least and also of course they're not getting the opportunity to speak about their history and in particular I'm talking about the pre-Islamic history of Iran um, openly and um, without prejudice and without uh, trouble as well so you know I always find when I'm speaking to Iranians that there's a great privilege in this sharing of information that goes on. Yeah, that's incredible. I suppose a lot of these things are filtered through political uh, ideology, religious Precisely. Experience. That leads me to the next question about, you know, what has been your experience teaching ancient Persia to students in the UK? How, how has that been? It's It's been a positive right from the beginning. Um, so the first time I sort of began to teach in Persian areas um, was actually a quite Hellenocentric view of it. It was a, a course which I inherited from a from a colleague when I was teaching at Exeter University called Greeks and Barbarians. So it really was that idea, you know, of, of, of the prejudice vision of the Greeks and, and looking at how they deal with Egyptians and Scythians and Persians were among them. And I privileged the Persians um, within the module. It was an interesting thing, of course, just to get myself familiar with the materials uh, which the Greeks had written about uh, the Persians. But it wasn't until another sort of maybe five years later when I was then lecturing in ancient history at Edinburgh University that I decided to, from the Persian version, but they all took to it very well um, and they enjoyed it. And the feedback from that first time I taught the course in Edinburgh um, really galvanized me to, to, to keep going. So over the years, now I'm at uh, Cardiff University, I have offered a variety of courses on, on ancient Iran the Achaemenids, um, one course called uh, Persian Superpowers, which deals with the Achaemenids, Parthians and Sasanians. I've looked at the history of ancient Iran through material culture and object studies. Um, I've also run courses called Ancient Persia, Modern Iran, which looks at the Shahnameh and the relationship between past and present uh, in Iranian society. And each time I've, I've taught these courses, the students have completely come with me on them. They've completely engaged um, and what to my proudest moments I suppose is the establishment in Edinburgh of a master's program in Iranian studies which I set up with some colleagues there and latterly uh, in in Cardiff um, the take-up of uh, masters and PhD topics on Iranian subjects from students of mine who have studied with me for three years and just don't want to give up they just want to carry on uh, with Persian things, uh, I think is a real testament to, to the nature of the subjects that we deal with, um, but also with their popularity as well. Um, so, so yes, things are looking good. And my experience of ancient Iran, teaching ancient Iran has been very positive and certainly is set to continue. I've no intention of giving up. Oh, great. I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> keep it going, <laughs> keep holding the torch. Yeah. But that's incredible. That, um, and, and do you think it has increased in over the last couple of years is there more interest um i think there i think there is more in, studies i think there is more interest but you know um i think iranian studies on the whole we are still quite uh, a navel gazing community and i think that there is a lot more work we need to do as a community mm -hmm. to get the uh, the love and the passion for our, our subject out there. Iranian studies, of course, is a very broad field, you know, and there's something for everybody in it. And that, that's something that we should really celebrate and enjoy. Um, and that kind of diversity. And I think, you know, when we do get together in things like the Symposium Iranica that happens every few years, we really get a sense of that, um, that occasion and that sort of long durée of the history that we, that we are studying of this incredible culture. But I think we need to do a lot more work with outreach. I think we need to be doing far more things with adults in education, as well as schools and colleges and universities too. Um, you know, the sad fact is that we've seen Persian studies departments close. We've seen the study of Persian language shut down. Um, we cannot afford to just keep this as a, as a, a wonderful secret between a small community. Mm -hmm. We have to get it out there. Um, I was really fascinated to see that after the BBC aired its uh, three-part documentary, The Art of Persia, the public take-up on that has been 
just overwhelming. You know, I mean, the, the great feedback that uh, Samira Ahmed uh, has, has had from that, including the fact that suddenly um, Fadousi Shah Nameh became a bestseller at Waterstones uh, really? as well. Yes, uh, yes, yeah, indeed, absolutely. You know, I wow. think the, 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 the television public are saturated with ancient Egypt, and I think they're looking for something different. And, oh, and Persia right. really does offer that, you know, in yeah. this incredible uh, scope and span of its history. Um, and I think that, you know, the last Shah or the Ayatollah Khomeini or uh, Cyrus the Great, they all have a resonance in the public mind. And I think people have a hunger uh, mm -hmm. to know more about it. It, it's it's still you know a 20th 21st century mystery to a lot of people isn't it so i think you know we need to lower the curtain and and, and not to um to keep this information privileged to ourselves we have to share it more mm -hmm. definitely I, I agree with you 100 percent on that and i think it's something that can be shared uh, within the community and mm. without the community you know to as you said outreach is so important getting people more interested and i think there is the appetite there, as you said, we, one, those in the community need to direct those who are interested to the right place. And I like what you said that Iranian history and Iranian studies, there's something for everybody. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. true. It's, it's, it's quite incredible. And um, my last question would be, well, what advice do you have for someone undertaking postgraduate study about ancient Iran? I mean, how easy is it to study ancient Iran in the UK? Um, well, it, it's a kind of... <sighs> You know, it, there's not a lot of choice, let's put it that way. If you want to um, study at postgraduate level, um, then, you know, there are a few uh, opportunities in London, uh, for instance, with um, the excellent uh, Lindsay Allen, for instance, mm -hmm. um, in St. Andrews with the wonderful um, uh, Tom Harrison. Uh, then, of course, there's myself in Cardiff. Um, each of us have, have kind of different leads into Persia. Um, and I would, my advice would be um, to sound out supervisors first, uh, make sure, of course, that, you know, that you, your interest somehow adjoins theirs so that you're going to get the best you can out of your supervisor. Uh, and make sure, of course, that the university is able to support your studies in terms of library facilities, for instance, mm -hmm. you know, have they got the right journals, have they got the right books? Um, uh, and also um, the kind of contacts that um, supervisors might have as well. So, for instance, if you're interested in ancient uh, archaeology of, of Iran, um, then, you know, what opportunities are there to work with archaeologists beyond your supervisor? All those kind of questions should should be asked. Also, um, the acquisition of languages as well. Do you need to have Persian? Not necessarily, but probably you'll need to have French and German uh, to be an ancient historian. I mean, more than, more than Farsi, actually. Um, what about learning old Persian? good idea are, are there um are there facilities for the learning of of ancient languages um within your institution as well so pick and choose i would say by your by the strength of the supervisor and the availability of the supervisor because it's the most important relationship you can possibly have um, during your phd you, you'll know yourself a phd is a long lonely winding road and your your supervisor is the person who can hold your hand through the whole thing um, and therefore you know getting that kind of relationship going is 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 so important so really trying to, to pin down what it is about their research that you like that you can put your research onto as well thank you so much for that it's a uh, really really uh, useful especially for uh, postgraduate students past future present and anyone who's interested in Iranian studies so thank you so much yes. for your time and for sharing your experiences uh, and ideas and thoughts uh, Rowena, you're very welcome. It's it's really lovely to speak to you, and I really do encourage you to continue with the uh, Iranian Studies Collective. I think it's a wonderful idea. We need to interact more. We need to speak more, exchange ideas, exchange our worries, and also exchange our successes as well. It's a very important thing. So thank you very much.